Hi, welcome to this podcast. I'm Linda Van Horn, editor of the Journal of the American Dietetic Association, and it's my pleasure today to talk to you a bit about a commentary recently published in the November issue of the journal regarding the work of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans are federally mandated in coordination with the USDA and the Department of Health and Human Services to provide evidence-based advice to promote health and reduce risk of major chronic diseases through optimal diet and regular physical activities. Since 1980, the Dietary Guidelines have been reviewed and revised every five years by a committee of experts from health, medical, and nutrition fields to determine whether new evidence since the last report warrants an updated review and revised recommendations. For the 2010 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, 13 qualified experts, including three dieti registered dietitians, were convened. I was privileged to serve as chair. Over 20 months, this team reviewed the world's literature relevant to the various chapters, specifically since 2005, to provide evidence-based recommendations and raise new emerging areas needing expertise. A summary of this experience and key findings from the chapters included in this report is provided as a commentary in the November 2010 issue of the journal. This podcast is intended to simply highlight some of the most notable findings and perhaps challenge you as readers and viewers to become involved in the translational applications of some of these recommendations. Stated most generally, the 2010 U.S. Dietary Guidelines advocate nutrient density and energy balance to promote good health. To the uninitiated, it might be tempting to suggest that not much has changed over the past 25 years since even in 1980 such advice was given. This would be an inaccurate assumption. Why? Well, first of all, this report is entirely evidence-based. The USDA Nutrition Evidence Library, or NEL, was established in 2009 and was used for answering 130 of the 180 scientific questions. Many of the reviews incorporated the Evidence Analysis Library of the ADA, as well as major systems and national databases. Second, it addresses for the first time an unhealthy American public. 72% of women and 64% of men are currently classified as overweight or obese. This report is written entirely through the filter of an obesogenic environment and the need to address this problem. Third, it includes a strong emerging evidence base on infants, children, and pregnant women. All previous reports address the population age two and older. Given the advance of data, evidence-based recommendations can increasingly address maternal, fetal, and infant nutrition goals. Fourth, it was conducted in a completely transparent manner. Six public meetings, webinars, data online provide access locally, nationally, and even internationally. It's all there if you want to take a look. Fifth, it includes two new chapters, one called the Total Diet Chapter and the other the Translational Implementation Chapter. As those titles would suggest, these were decided upon by the group as a consensus to help address how to take the recommendations and apply them to the population at large. Sixth, it includes 12 USDA food pattern modeling analyses to help address the matters of practicality and nutrient adequacy. Where epidemiology data stop, the modeling data fill in the gaps and missing information related to how do you actually apply these recommendations in the real world. What has been the U.S. response to the previous dietary guidelines? Well, this can be illustrated in two slides. First, what we see is that energy balance and weight management uh, have changed over time. Unfortunately, for the, over the last 30 years, the American public has increased their caloric intake by 617 calories per day. Also, unfortunately, the mean intakes of calories from solid fats and added sugars, known as SOFAs, uh, by age group have 
also increased dramatically to the point where, especially in um, adolescent boys, intake has increased to 500 or more calories per day. Whereas the consensus of this advisory committee is that most people should consume no more than 10 to 15 percent of their calorie intake from solid fats or added sugars. These represent far greater intake than is advisable. What makes us think that this report will do more? Well, the work of the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee was just that, to advise. The real test comes now in the translation of these recommendations into real life, practical, applicable changes in the environment. We need to move from the excess intakes of calories, sofas, saturated fats, sodium, to the foods that are rich in the shortfall nutrients, including fiber, calcium, vitamin D, and potassium. And of course, these are the foods that include fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. This slide illustrates quite clearly that we are far below the recommended goal as far as intake of these food groups and far above the limits that have been placed on some of these other micronutri macronutrients and foods. Overall, the work has begun on the policies, practices, and consumer education needed to make this happen. Matters such as labeling, school nutrition, the WIC program, and restaurant menus will ad be addressed with new and better recommendations. A host of other approaches are also being reviewed and considered by DHHS and USDA. You, the registered dietitian, as well as other readers and viewers, can help to put these guidelines into practice within the context of your own employment and your own expertise. Please check out the guidelines online, making sure that you have the opportunity to look at the data yourself and get a sense of where the evidence for these recommendations have come from. Together, we can help provide both the scientific rationale and the translational approaches needed to make these guidelines hit the mark and make a difference in this nation's health. Thanks for joining.